Good afternoon. Let's kick off in the afternoon session. Colleagues, friends, stakeholders, could you please take a seat? This is another exciting panel. So this panel is uh, dig digital economy and digitalization and fintech. And as, as all of us know, these days, insurance conference, without talking about fintech, digital economy, there is no audience. And just for a fact, we had a, a question about the panel, the themes of the panel, or subjects of the panel for annual conference in November. And half of Fitch is related to digital and the fintech issue. Of course, we cannot accommodate all these needs, but you will see in the annual conference also we discuss this issue. In other words, it's a very important subject and stakeholder, particularly industry, knows that how do you accommodate this digital economy and fintech in your business? And naturally, regulators, we think about very carefully too. What the association IIS does is we issued paper, recent development of fintech issue, and also, the day before yesterday, we agreed that this as association will, will create a network where regulators communicate, exchange information, monitor, and particularly regulatory issues we discuss carefully. So this is really topical issue. And again, it's led, uh, it will be discussed excellent panelists. My role is introduced to uh, introduce, introduce you to our uh, panelist moderator, Tan Lee. You have already seen her in the morning. I know her more than 10 years. And uh, she's excellent contributor to the IEIS to make a bridge between CIRC, China, and enhance enormously Chinese presence in our association. In addition, of course, she has a profound knowledge, of course, charming and also excellent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and China is a now leading economy in this digital, uh, digital insurance issue or fintech issue. So it's the idea of a uh, panel moderator or chairman or chair, chairperson. And yes, I just turn over to you, Tandi. Thanks. Well, thank you, Yoshi, for your very kind introduction. I especially love the part about charming. <laughs> OK. Uh, so this session um, is a very interesting one about digitalization in the insurance sector. So um, welcome back. Um, well, as you might know that in February this year, the IAIS uh, published a report on fintech developments in the insurance industry. Um, it's an interesting report, so I encourage everyone to read it. Well, basically, it uh, highlights the potential impact of the fintech on the insurance sector. Um, also, it analyzes the potential impact on the insurance industry in three scenarios. But I'm not going to go through these uh, findings one by one, where there are a lot of findings, very interesting findings. Um, but uh, Stephen Klaus, who is a member of the task force, uh, in his presentation will give you uh, an idea of the key findings. Um, OK, I, I will need to keep my int introduction short, because I think you're, you can't wait to hear the panelists. OK, so can I invite the panelists to the stage? Thank you. Our first panelist, um, Stephen Klaus. Uh, oh, yes, Stephen Klaus um, is the technical head of the General Insurance Division from the Bank of England. He leads a team of uh, technical experts to scan risk horizon, including the impact of autonomous vehicles and insure tech on the general insurance industry. He's a member of the FinTech FinTech Task Force of the IAIS. 
And then we have a uh, Hake fighter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the head of uh, NN Group PNC Retail. Uh, she is responsible for the retail products and the distribution of the uh, NN Group in the Netherlands and in Belgium. So she's um, uh, responsible for very important work for making the insurance more personal and digital to their 1.4 million consumers. And also I heard that she has did something uh, incredible, traveled by bicycle from Netherlands to China in 11 months. <laughs> um, and um, then we have Peter Kockenberger from the United States. He's the deputy director of Insurance Law Center and associate clinical professor of law. I'm not so very sure what clinical professor <laughs> is, but I'm sure it's very important. Um, from the University of Connecticut School of Law. He's experienced in insurance law and he also has publications on big data and insurance regulation. He's also a funded consumer representative to NAIC. And the last but the not the least, Peter Brad Olson. So you find that we have two peeps on the panel. Um, he is from McKinsey. He's associate uh, principal in McKinsey's business technology office in Copenhagen. He has more than 16 years of uh, technology and business integration track record. His current focus, of course, in Shortech. Um, he leads McKinsey's in Shortech service line. He also oversees the build up of McKinsey's global in Shortech database. Very important job. Okay, so um, the, pre the presentations will start from Peter from McKinsey. Thanks a lot. Do we have the, the presentation? The slides? Yes, you, you, can, you can either speak here okay. or uh, yeah, at okay. the podium. So I hope I find my slides at some stage. But um, so I wanted to, here they are. So I wanted to talk about sort of the insure tech. Um, the small startup companies, technology-based companies that are making inroads into, into insurance. And I think this is uh, sort of, we, a couple of, uh, I think one and a half years ago, we decided we wanted to understand what was really going on here. So we built a, a big database of, uh, of insurance and interviewed a lot of them to understand what was going on. And the reason we, we did that was not sort of out of academic interest, uh, but, but to understand what was going on. Because many of the clients we had, they were asking us, so, so what's really happening here? And, and the, when I talk about clients here, it's sort of the incumbent insurers. Uh, should I be worried about this? What can I learn? So that was really how we, we, we started looking at that. And I think you probably all know the lemonades, the, the trolls of this world, but there's, there's probably more than a thousand or so that we would call insurtechs today and the number is growing every day. And I think there are many reasons for that. One of the reasons being that, I mean, funding, there's a lot of money around, so they can get funding. Secondly, it has become much, much easier, actually, to set up a technology company with cloud services, with uh, open source software, and so forth. But I think, actually, one of the key reasons why we are seeing sort of the growth in, in insurtechs is actually because of the customers. So one of the topics today, what does this mean for the customers? Because when we see at sort of the, the new insurance customer, uh, and many of them are increasingly becoming digital. First of all, they have a super, you could say, or not super, but at least a more complex interaction pattern than sort of the customers had in the past, where they perhaps only talk to an agent. And secondly, as you see on the right-hand side here, they are also more demanding. So all of this, so you have capital, you have ease of setting up companies, and you have a customer that is actually requesting perhaps something a little bit new and something more digital. That is uh, some of the reasons why we have sort of this insurtech wave right now. Because when we survey, when we look into the digital maturity, and of course that's not uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, but in general, they actually perform not too well. And they don't perform well uh, sort of 
when compared to many of the services, the digital services we are used to, they, they, are, they are almost appalling in terms of how well they do digital. Of course not uh, NM. So there's a lot of room for doing something new. And uh, this is where the insurtechs come in. And they've already made their inroads uh, in, into, into the industry. As you can see here, they may operate across lines of business, um, sort of perhaps mostly in, uh, in, um, in, in PNC. And they also cover the entire insurance value chain. So this is the picture, and it's, it's of course constantly moving, but, but there is uh, at the same time a, focus, a tendency of focus on sort of the distribution uh, part of the, of the value chain. So when you look at this picture, there's two more things that you should keep in mind. First of all, I mean, this is mostly personal lines so far. I think it's like 80 to 90% of the insurtechs that we survey are sort of personal lines focused. But they are now also making inroads into, into, into commercial lines where it will also be relevant. And the second thing is that you probably tend to think of these guys as, well, they are here really to uberize insurance they are going to completely change the game and the incumbents are going to have a really hard time. Some of it is true, but actually two thirds of the insurtechs that, uh, that, uh, that we have around today, they are more focused on enabling the value chain, so actually providing services, interacting with the incumbent insurers. And I think that's, that's important to keep in mind. Then another third roughly or so are focused on disintermediating the customer. And then finally, there are a few that are providing sort of end-to-end -end insurance, a little bit like the old players, so to speak, but just to set a little bit of context here. And what is it that they do uh, when we talk about doing insurance in a new way? Well, there's probably five things, or at least when we interview and we survey them. So one is that they have a focused offer. So focused offer not being across many lines of business, but narrowing down the focus perhaps even narrowing down the, the segment of customers they go for, or narrowing down the part of the value chain that they focus on. So very focused as opposed to, you, I, I think, many sort of traditional insurers. The second thing is, and, and perhaps the most important thing, is that there's an extreme focus on customer engagement. Be it through, you could say, trying to create a social contract with the, um, uh, with the, with the end customer, with peer-to-peer -peer offerings, or be it through raising the number of interactions <coughs> through on-demand insurance. Then thirdly, they are digital by default. They don't have a legacy they have to care about. Fourthly, they are early adopters of new technology. So new technology, and that, that's also one of the things we're going to discuss today, they are trying to put this to business use even faster than the incumbents. And then the last thing I wanted to mention on them is that sort of the kind of companies we are looking at here are very different. So smaller, younger people, with a more of a risk-taking culture, and perhaps also an end game that is different from what we see with the incumbent insurers. So an end game for these guys might be grow, get some market share, and then be sold to private equity or to an, uh, to an incumbent, which is slightly different than perhaps the more going concern way that uh, an incumbent insurer would look at things. And then I'll stop as soon as I can. The last thing I wanted to say is that as of today, we don't know if insurtechs or any insurtechs are going to be super, super successful. But what we do know, and, and this chart actually explains it a little bit, that sort of the incumbent insurers that are trying to follow or are following the same playbook in terms of having this digital focus and customer focus, like the insurtechs, they're actually growing faster and growing more profitably than their peers that are not doing this too well. And I think, at least for me, it tells me that this is going to happen, regardless of whether it's the insurtechs or the incumbents, this is going to happen. And, and I think, at the end of the day, this is fueled by also a customer demand for, uh, for these kind of solutions. So that was what I wanted to start by saying. Thank you, Peter. And next, uh, can we have Stefan? Uh, okay, hello. Uh, I, want to, I want to give two perspectives, really. One, because I'm from the prudential regulator, it's sort of um, capturing, as a prudential regulator, how do we make sure that we stay on, on top of the uh, developments in Shortech when actually, as uh, Peter illustrated, a lot of it is on the distribution side. 
and two as one of the authors of um, the IAIS's FinTech uh, summary report. I thought I'd give you a quick summary for those who, who haven't had a chance to read it. So first of all, actually going on to the paper, uh, so the, the InsureTech paper, this was a result of a, an industry roundtable, it's literature reviews and our sort of collective experience among a number of um, regulators around the world on, on where, where the InsureTech industry was going. And I, and I should add, actually, when you read that, you'll see the brief. It's, it's perhaps quite supervisory. It's looking at the conceivable risks. Uh, it, it clearly doesn't label some of the benefits that uh, we acknowledge clearly are there um, as this uh, technology supports and changes potentially the insurance industry. So it was clear early on, I think, um, that there were too many unknowns that uh, would allow us to form a, f uh, a view on, on the likely consequences of fintech. For instance, in many cases, we felt that the technology was still as yet unproven. Um, certainly, sort of things like uh, digi distributed ledger technology, it still feels like it's at a very early stage. And some of the new products that are being discussed and actively discussed also <coughs> rely on changing consumer habits, which it's not yet certain whether, and whether that's being sustainable. The, that there's much talk about the um, sharing economy, but to what extent actually will it grow beyond a certain, certain size? So instead, we focused, our primary aim was to pr pr present scenario-based, which I know you, you already highlighted, um, and looking at a, through a regulatory lens as to whether they're likely to be higher or lower than today. And I think that's valuable, because I think as regulators, it's just to make sure that when we look at this technology, we look at it in a consistent light to the risks that are apparent today and not just uh, take a harsher view pure, simply because they are new. So the, scenario, the three scenarios that we looked at basically ranged from a relatively benign scenario where we um, looked at scenarios where the insurance companies are continue to be in control of the insurance value chain and they harness uh, all the uh, tech firms. So at the moment what we're seeing is there's a lot of uh, smaller tech firms and arguably they are then trying to team up with, at the moment, particularly capital-rich incumbents all the way through to a situation where the insurance value chain would be very much fragmented, where either the insurance company would just be like a white-labeled good providing capacity at the back end, or even sidelined in its entirety. These scenarios were looked through the lens of the following sort of seven supervisory criteria. So there we looked at the competitiveness of the industry. Will it change it? We looked at the, uh, secondly, consumer choice of products available. Will it increase it? Will it reduce it? Thirdly was, are there any aspects of this development, which means that insurers will be more interconnected? So the level of interconnectedness through the industry. Uh, the fourth is the ability for regulatory oversight. Will we get the right information and be able to actually track and monitor when the risks are building up and by how much? Fifth, it's about business model viability. So we looked at business model viability, but also the adequacy of the capital regime to support it. So in, the, in Europe, we have the Solvency II capital regime. Will that still be appropriate under these developments? Sixth was the conduct of business, including transparency of pricing. And then seventh was around data ownership. Now, given the, the, uh, the focus of this session is around benefits and risks to consumers, I just thought we, um, I'd draw out three of those ones, one being the competitiveness of the industry. And interestingly, our view was under most of these scenarios that we would expect competition to reduce. In part, that reflects sort of two key drivers. One was technology has the potential to reduce and mitigate risk, leaving less risk to transfer. And as we see in other areas that have been disrupted by technology, ultimately, it, it never feels like um, it's, it's, it's creating more competition, <laughs> rather, rather the opposite effect. The second is the potential reduction for consumer choice. And this actually was, uh, we sort of, uh, we're thinking around the lines of, somewhat counterintuitive, but as the products become ever more personalized, the ability to move provider could become ever more cumbersome. So, so anyone who's tried to move from an Apple operating system to a Samsung and you've got loads of connected gadgets knows how cumbersome, what a pain that is. And whether we could see that when you have a lot more connectivity and personalization of your insurance needs. 
And finally, the third aspect is the conduct of business, and specifically the transparency of pricing. And I think this was mentioned in, your, in, in an earlier session as well, where it was talking about uh, the transparency between when is it a service, when is it a warranty, when is it an insurance, and to what extent actually the consumer has clarity around that one, and uh, the, the, the risks that actually then the pricing may not be aligned to uh, the consumer. So that, that, that sort of gives you a headline in terms of, of, of what, what sort of things we discussed in the framework, and I think it, it, it can provide a very good framework as the industry, as this, um, as in sure tech, uh, but basically changes as to whether these scenarios will play out in reality. So, okay, so what are we doing at the Bank of England uh, to basically make sure that we continue to monitor these, these developments and the changing landscape? I mean... On the one side, I'd say we, we, we have a very good dialogue with the FCA and understanding where, the, where they're going with their project Innovate and understanding the new technology that's coming out there. The second one is having a strong relationship with the bank's own fintech accelerator. So I don't know whether any of you know, but the Bank of England has its own fintech accelerator that looks at technology for its own benefit. So as a clearing clearing. House, and essentially what we're looking at and have been doing over the last 18 months is teaming up with certain technology firms in, in actually looking at how best we can harness that new tech for our own benefit. And so I know we're now in our third round of, of proof of concept. And so, for instance, now we're looking at firms that can help us uh, analyse unstructured data and big data to, to basically analyse, say, all the uh, reports under Solvency 2. And I think this is actually quite valuable because it gives us a chance to actually road test the technology for ourselves and understand whether um, and what the issues are that firms are facing when they're adopting it. Secondly, we're also instigating deep dive reviews in terms of how firms, particularly the insurance companies, um, are managing their exposures. And so to the extent that uh, InsureTech MGA, or sorry, the distribution channel mean that insurers have less information potentially if as, again, one of the previous speakers said, you have these data warehouse, does, does that mean there's a degradation in the ability for the insurers to manage their exposures? And then, fourthly, I'd say we also instigate certain um, research, and, and that effectively is, yes, it's, it's, it's a good way to understand some of those risks, but it's also valuable for us to engage with stakeholders who we, w who we normally wouldn't engage with. So, for instance, earlier this year, we instigated a research on what is the impact of autonomous vehicles on insurance companies. And part of that was actually to engage in stakeholders who we typically wouldn't engage with, be it the auto manufacturers, be it tech firms, and even be it the UK government on the Department for Transport to understand what their agenda were in driving these changes forward. So that's just some of the, uh, the, the initiatives to ensure that a prudential regulator stays on top of the developments. And next, we have uh, Hike from MEN Group. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, IAIS, for this opportunity to speak in this panel. Um, I would like to address three perspectives. And I do have a slide button. Um, on how digital impacts uh, our customers. And uh, I thought of three items. I thought of propositions, customer engagement, and of course, as a bottom layer, data analytics. And um, let's start with the first one, propositions. To my opinion, um, digital shifting insurance to a, a far more personal and relevant level uh, a few examples from the connected area and the shared area. Uh, we've got two connected car propositions on the road. Um, tracking customer driving behavior, relating that to premium uh, and discounts. But also since last week, we've got bundles. That is a prepaid motor insurance company. Uh, only for those who drive now and then instead of a lot, and that might be a nice new perspective on, on demand. Um, so by doing this, uh, we do think that uh, driving behavior and 
coming closer to customer's life, we can add more value. Carrying to the connected home field, um, we did also an interesting thing. We came up with a little nice proof of concept proposition and it started with a connected doorbell. Completed with sensors and a uh, kind of a community uh, safety program. And the last bit, only the last bit, was an insurance product. So it's a completely different approach of uh, how to get security to our customers' lives. Um, another one, on the shared economy side. Uh, this is about uh, lending your friend's car and when hitting a wall, not hitting his premium discount. That's nice, no? That is what friendship is about. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I think this is good. But let's first talk about risk, because you asked us, Lee, to address a bit on the risk and the benefit side. So the risk is, of course, there's always the, the risk of data security and cyber security, as we found out last week. Uh, and there's a, this is an issue we have to manage. But on the other hand, looking at the benefits, we do think that it brings risk reduction, it brings a sense of security, and it fits better to our personal lives. So and by that means, I think it's worthwhile trying to manage the risks. Um, a second perspective, a second perspective on customer engagement. And Peter also already said something about it. Um, mobile first truly shifts customer engagement in the insurance industry to an understandable level. That's my opinion. Uh, it push, pushes us to communicate in a far simpler way because it just won't fit on a four inch screen. It does make a difference. And for another example, what we did uh, uh, last quarter, we redesigned uh, one of our product lines. And we did it the other way around. So let's start with customer engagement, for instance, Facebook Messenger. And from that po starting point on, think about how we interact with our customers and engage them into your insurance service. And then think of what kind of products we do we need to match this customer interaction. And that's a completely other way around than saying your uh, IT developer, please build me a portal to push this product. It's a different approach. Um, so benefits. I think benefits, a bigger chance that customers really understand what they just bought, and that's good. And what about the risk? Not so much, I guess, except for that we include a lengthy legal statement after all somewhere down there, because we have to, to, to prevent misuse. Uh, but that's okay, no? In the balance. And then um, back to the last item, data analytics that was in the bottom. Uh, well, Big data is a fact of life. We can like it or not, but it's there and it's expanding. Um, and it even might uh, bring opportunities to both customers and insurance companies. For example, um, we offer our com uh, customers opportunities with next best action kind of approach. And sometimes it serves like, well, we know how old your car is. You might push down your coverage a bit to sales, and we found out that our bank saving customers really do appreciate when we offer a legal protection product. Okay, in both sides, service and sales, we do see your net promoter score significantly go up. So I guess this works for our customers. What's the benefit then? Um, I think the benefit from the data, big data, data analytics tools is definitely being on the, the more personal and relevant uh, uh, side, as I just explained on the propositions. On the risk, I can imagine that more tailored products also bring more tailored pricing. That's a bit included. For instance, going back to my bundles proposition, the prepaid, when you offer these kind of propositions to customers that do drive a little, that also means that in the normal products, there are customers that do drive a lot and not pay for it. So, of course, this more granular approach has an impact. Um, and that were my three points on uh, customer impact. 
So, uh, Lee, uh, dear panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you this is a very exciting era for a non-life company. Thank you. Thank you, Heik. That's a very interesting presentation. Um, the, the last we will hear from Peter, uh, from Peter Kockenberger. Please. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the IIS for inviting me here. It is a pleasure. The last time I uh, went to a meeting was several years ago, so it's wonderful to be back and to see many familiar faces. I'm going to uh, be uh, quick. Uh, there's so many things any of us could talk about. Um, and also, I think some of the remarks both uh, my uh, panelists, fellow panelists had, as well as mine, will pick up a lot of um, some of the discussions, particularly in the last two, the last two sessions. Um, and that is, the, what is the appropriate balance? How do we find a regulatory balance, a legislative balance, a business balance on protecting consumers and encouraging innovation? And I think the insure tech, fin fintech paper that IAIS does, as along with other work, really demonstrates the challenge of that. Um, and as I'll quickly go through in a few minutes, um, it's, I think big data makes this a difficult a task that is always difficult for regulators, which is, at least in the United States, but I think anywhere, which is to keep up with industry developments, uh, whether it's in insurance, banking, or any product. But technology and technological development and use has its own pace, its own methods, its own uh, you know, sense of urgency that doesn't fit in well with careful, reasoned, deliberate regulation, which is, of course, what regulators are supposed to be doing. And so in the ability to balance means the ability, first of all, I think, uh, for regulators and, and the legislators to understand what the product is and how it works. That used to be somewhat easy. It is increasingly difficult. Uh, and I think some of the discussions talked about that. There's many benefits, obviously, in uh, big data, uh, for not only for consumers, for legislators, but also uh, well, uh, for business, but also for consumers and policyholders. But as so many things are, it's very double-edged. Uh, the questions, the potential, and the value of big data also comes with many concerns about data ownership and security, privacy, uh, and the access and affordability of insurance. And insure tech, the paper, the IAS Fund Tech paper talks about this. When we talk about a term we might use in the United States, which uh, is fragmentation of the insurance markets, which is also a term that the IRS uses. And the ability to much more accurately predict risk on a granular level means that some people are going to pay less, and some people are going to pay more, and some of them are going to pay a lot more. And what does that mean for basic products like auto and homeowners insurance? And who's going to make those decisions as to what the risk classification should be? And particularly in this area, but it's true, I think, in most businesses, certainly in insurance, if you don't make it, you being the regulators, if you don't make that decision, Decision, then it will be made for all of us, but it'll be made by industry. That's not necessarily bad, but it's you know their their role is not the overall public good, um, but of course you know, to, you know generally, but to make a fair and reasonable profit for their customers, for their policyholders. So these decisions as to privacy and appropriate risk classification and how risk should be allocated and what risk society should bear versus uh, the individual are increasingly implicated by big data and data analytics and quite really challenge, I think, all of us, insurance regulators themselves, uh, to look at it. I provide an example there. I just saw that in a Mars publication. Um, you know, this is a good chance, I think, example of the balance. Uh, uh, a baseball calf that monitors cognitive activity and will send signals back to the company, this would be like a truck driver, as to how tired that driver is. Now that's a wonderful thing in part because right, truck uh, fatigue is a major cause of accidents, particularly for truck drivers. Truck and accidents kill many people. Uh, so this is a way to get tired drivers off the road. Well, that's a real plus. It's good for workers' compensation, which is uh, maybe used, but also just simply for liability insurance and society in general. But who monitors that? What agreement does, does, the, does the truck driver have any ability to say yes or no and keep their job? Should they have any ability? What, act, what uh, else is monitored? What happens to that data afterwards? Is it simply destroyed? Data rarely is really destroyed, as we know. Uh, so these are questions in which a product can really provide benefits, but also creates, in fact, probably more questions. Um, I have long convinced, but also particularly, I think, now with big data, that 
no one can uh, can't argue with the need for disclosure and transparency. But the idea that I think that that is a protects consumers alone. That if we simply tell consumers what's how their data is going to be used or what their insurance contract looks like, regardless of what the terms are, that that's sufficient. And uh, no one reads their insurance policies, or almost no one. No one reads. I clicked on how many things in the last two days. How many things have you clicked on? Twitter, uh, downloading books, movies, accessing your, using your credit card. We've all agreed to terms and conditions of which, at least I know, we don't have any idea whether we would find them you know, reasonable or not. But obviously, they have to be enforceable. I use this in class because it's a great example. It's sort of funny, too. But a game company in April 1st, 2010, put in their online contract and buried in like page 20. You've agreed that we can sell your soul to the devil. And if you agree, you don't have to do anything. If you want to opt out, you can opt out. And we'll give you, uh, I think it was five pounds as well. Well, 88% of the people agreed. I'm actually think it's remarkable that that many, that 12% actually read it and caught it. But I'm assuming there was some social media that reflected it. But again, the point is, we can't rely on disclosure. It's important, but we can't rely on it to actually go ahead uh, to provide sufficient protection in itself. Which means, among other things, substantive regulation of some of the, you know, the underwriting as well as the terms of some contracts. Um, I want to wrap up, I apologize, I think I've, I've gone a little over, uh, maybe one more minute. But particularly, I think big data uh, and sure tech within the claims handling and, you know, and fraud as a subset of that is particularly a concern um, or an opportunity and a concern. And obviously, consumer fraud, for example, if, if, uh, insurance fraud is a major problem, reducing it is significant. But how are the al algorithms or analytical tools that are addressing insurance fraud, how are they, you know, who looks at them? Are they accurate? How are they used? Do they access appropriate data? Inappropriate data. I have no idea, but that's okay because I don't regulate insurance companies. But it's great to cut down on fraud, but we know, at least in the United States, that credit reports and much information collected can often be inaccurate. So if a claim is tagged as potentially fraudulent, when does the policyholder know? If the consumer, if the insurer still pays the claim, is that red flag on their record for the rest of their insurance lives, where it affects their under, you know, what they pay for and access to insurance? When do consumers know that and should they know that? Uh, and what happens, of course, if the information is accurate, inaccurate? Um, lemonade insurance, how many people have heard of lemonade insurance? It's, it's probably the best example in the United States of an insurer tech company, a new entrant, emerging as a true insurer and offering homeowners and renters insurance, and it's all on a digital platform. Um, they pay the claim in three seconds. They, use, uh, or they have a behavioral economist on, on their senior staff. The claim handling, the underwriting and claim handling methodology is deliberately targeted to that, which is great. Uh, and someone submitted a claim, and uh, within, I think it was, yeah, I think they said three seconds, um, they ran 18 anti fraud algorithms and paid the claim, wired the money within less than 10 seconds. This is great. But what happens if one of those anti fraud algorithms came up and was said, no, it's potentially fraudulent. Who's going you know, to know about that? Who's going to check the accuracy? And in fact, are these algorithms accurate and correct? Math may be neutral, but all the assumptions that go into a model cannot be by definition. And I think this leads to some important challenges, not simply in the United States. Um, but again, to get back to the theme, at least one theme is in terms of developing the balance, the first step of developing a regulatory balance, I think, is to understand the product. That's particularly challenging uh, given the level of expertise and knowledge that regulators have to have in which the, everyone is competing uh, for that same group of knowledge. Um, but thank you very much. Oh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Actually, I almost gave up my immortal soul. So that was close. <laughs> um, well, following on that, I, uh, I um, hope that um, the, um, you won't mind me asking a follow-up question on the, on the information um, disclosure, uh, the disclosure consent uh, in this age. So uh, Peter, do, do you think it's sufficient to have the uh, written disclosure uh, as 
Um, and what does consent mean um, in the age of the electronic form contracts? Right, and I think, I mean, I think what consent means, for, at least for me and for probably most people, is that I've clicked on, I, accept the I have read the terms and conditions, which of course I haven't, uh, and I've clicked on accept. And that is, you know, uh, now is that adequate disclosure? Probably not. On the other hand, you can't simply, we're not going to go to a society where every contract is handwritten. So form contracts, which have existed a long time, you know, that, that they have to be used. The question in part is, but will disclosure alone protect consumers? And I think absolutely not, in part because not only do they not read, what's the competition? I mean, if you want to buy a product, an insurance product, you know, the, we, as we know as professionals that the exclusions in insurance and how like, something is written is very important. But no one uh, buys insurance whether the intentional harm exclusion says one thing versus another. You know, we know, you know, it's important if it never gets challenged, but it's not how people buy. So I don't think transparency, by, so transparency in the digital age becomes even more difficult because of the ability to add the terms, but also I think it goes to uh, the need for regulators to, and, and legislators to have the, both the legal authority and the willingness to prohibit, or, you know, to prohibit or require specific terms because it's not an area where there's a mark, consumer market that'll do it. Um, do you have specific suggestions for like the supervisors? Well, uh, sure, just one that uh, actually Bernie Birnbaum and I are working on at the NEIC, which is, um, in some of it, uh, is to ban insurance, we ask insurance supervisors and legislatures to not a, have mandatory arbitration, dispute arbitration in insurance policies. And the idea there is, of course arbitration can have advantages, but for the policyholder, in order, in the United States, you're literally giving up a constitutional right if you give up your right to trial. You have a right to do that, but that it should be a known waiver. And that uh, it, you know, the consumer and the insurer should be able to agree on arbitration at the point of a specific claim. But to have it in the policy, I think it's a perfect example of a term that people will not read, won't really be able to value the benefits in abstract. I mean, insurance company can, but how does a uh, you know, how does an individual who's trying to buy car insurance going to be able to val weigh whether I want arbitration or not? So there's really no consent. So I think that's a term that should be not allowed, uh, and arbitration should only be allowed, perhaps encouraged, but allowed or encouraged uh, when there's a specific dispute. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, I have a question for Hike. Just now you mentioned some very interesting examples of these um, technological innovations used in insurance. Um, one of them talks about uh, the uh, tailor-made products. Drivers who do not drive often uh, can also get um, insurance coverage. So um, do you think that tailor-made products based on big data can, can reduce the comparability of products? Hmm. Good question. Um, to my home market, Holland, uh, comparison of products is morally done via comparison websites. Um, and to my feeling, these are over-focusing on price. So when looking at this from a failure perspective, um, I'm not so convinced that this is the way forward on comparison. And I do urge the, that industry to come up with more sensible criteria, better algorithms, etc., to really um, value value for our customers and, uh, and make a better uh, comparison. So um, I, I rather push that way than say we should go back to standard products, whatever. It feels to me a bit like last century, uh, because and by that means uh, price comparison has a better comparison. I mean that's the other way around. Mm -hmm. But any anyway, there are competitors. So maybe several insurance companies will offer um, similar products to to the yeah. same person, so he can get a different quote from different companies, so he can still compare them. In what way? Price. <laughs> But, uh, now, of course, but uh, I think uh, price in comparison is really overrelated, over mm -hmm. overrated. Uh, I, I would really urge for getting away from that corner uh, because 
this is about trust. This is about a company that pays the bill when you're needed. Uh, and that's something completely different than uh, how to, uh, where to get the, the cheapest uh, insurance company. So please, l let's focus a bit more on value, tailoring, really delivering shoes when it gets, it gets hard. Um, I, w I would rather move that way than, than standard price, etc. Thank you for that very important observation. I, I, I fully agree. I think when people talk about the old world, well, you easier to compare, and then you ended up comparing prices. I mean, was that really better? And, and I think actually what we're also seeing that some, some of the insurtechs, you know, a lot of these insurtechs, right, some of them are actually focused on giving better advice. So, um, for instance, some of the digital brokers, uh, we see policy genius in the US. So, so I think sort of this technological evolution is, is also actually perhaps uh, improving the ability for advice and also comparability at the end. Mm. Um, so it's yeah. not only price. Well, talking about uh, advice, there are some insurance companies that use uh, automated machines to provide advice. So how do you look at that? For my opinion? Um, what we see, uh, for instance, in the motor insurance market uh, is that 80% of customers tend to start online at a price comparison website, which is enormous. And uh, I guess only 7% really buy on that point. So that makes us aware that com customers do tend to look differently to their final sale. Um, and they do go to a broker in the end, or to a bank, uh, assurance, or uh, whatever other uh, distributor. Um, for me, I, when I would put up a robot advice, I would put in a human factor somehow. I think uh, stepping out towards uh, robot chat or whatever chatbot, and finally, please give me a please call me now button when I really uh, are confused and, and need your human help. I would always put that in somewhere. Hmm. I see. Yeah. Yes. One, uh, one aspect I think on when you mentioned trust, and of course that's been a theme throughout. And I remember in our, our annual conference in 2014, that was one of the big issues. Why, how do we get consumers, policyholders to trust in insurance products? And one thing with the strikes me in the comp price comparison shops, whether the insurers or insurance intermediaries, is actions like that Google's been accused of really damage that trust. If I, you know, if I want to use big data, and, it, and I absolutely agree, it can be a marvelous tool for evaluating multiple policies in multiple terms. But if in fact that tool, that pricing tool or whatever, is is going to have you know, is going to be affected by who pays and what will steer people to insurers or whatever the product is that pay them more, just like Google steers you search terms. If you pay, then we've violated one of the you know central trusts of the, of the industry and one of the major values of big data. So yeah. it's, I think it's you know it's, I think it's a good example where big data can enhance trust, but it can also easily more easily destroy it as well. Okay. Um, well, we talked a lot about uh, the, uh, the risks that uh, technology may bring to the insurance consumers, but um, now let's shift to the bright side. How can the uh, technology benefit uh, our consumers? So on um, my panelists, do, um, which innovation do you think benefits the consumers best at present? Well, I can go first then. I, I think actually, actually, sort of all together, this sort of the digital interaction, uh, if we see that collectively as an innovation, I think that is a great way forward actually, actually for insurance. I think when you compare insurance to many other industries, the number of interactions are extremely few. And I think this is, an, and that's also some of the stuff that you are doing. Uh, I mean, this is increasing sort of the, the number of interactions. And I think that is actually also good uh, for the customer. And then to be extremely practical, sort of one of the ways of doing that is mobile. I think, for instance, um, there's, there's a, a private equity-backed company called Bima. Um, they sat down uh, some days and discussed, so we know insurance penetration is low in Africa. We know mobile penetration is, is extremely high. Can we make something great out of that? A and they started providing sort of um, insurance via your mobile invoice. And all of a sudden, I mean, that is super, uh, I think, impactful and beneficial. You have a lot of people that weren't insured before. Now they are actually being insured by the combination of, of technology and, and, and people sort of being creative about using it. 
so, so I think this the connectivity uh, is is the key thing, and then fundamentally also think that some of the conceptual innovations like well micro insurance like for instance Bima, but also actually the usage based insurance is uh, is good for 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 the customer. So um, yeah, I don't know if you. Of I do fully agree. Uh, I mean, this customer interaction side, that is the, the, the first benefit that you do see. And of course, there's more technology on the backside and the, the blockchain, etc. But for a consumer uh, in, a, in a broader market reach, that's, that's, no, that's not big yet. But um, so customer interaction definitely is the, the big bonus from now. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think, well, I mean, with looking at claims handling, I mean, one of the, it's always interesting to read how uh, tech vendors describe their products, in part because they're sometimes very tone deaf to the nuances of insurance and what it means. But, you know, the, the claim products that talk about being able to lemonade, maybe an extreme example, very quickly pay undisputed claims is a wonderful thing. I mean, yeah, it's one of the biggest object, you know, when it's the source of the complaints, I think, at least in the United States, is how claims are paid and when they're paid. This can dramatically improve that. Of course, it does have the flip side of, all right, if, when, what does claim optimization mean? If it means we're gonna pay your more claims quickly and efficiently and accurately, that's a great thing. If it also means, because the technology and the analytics certainly exist to do it, if it means we also can use our predictive analytics to determine that Peter's sort of lazy, and if we give him a $50 and a $100 claim, he's likely to take it because he wants the money up front. Well, that's, that violates the, the trust of insurance as well. Uh, so I think, it's, I think the efficiency gains can be significant, but there's also the potential downside. But uh, the other side, uh, when it comes to fraud, I mean, my customers should rely on me that I do my utmost best to, to catch fraud. Uh, in, in Dutch market, I think there's more or less 100 million going around. I mean, that's, that's premium of my customers, no? And I think they can rely on me that I put my utmost best to, uh, to prevent that as much as possible. Hmm. Okay, very interesting answers. Um, thank you for that, and Stefan? It's more from, from a personal perspective, you know, as a consumer, I mean, I mean clearly I, I would want something which uh, engages and pays out when I would expect that claim to be paid out, uh, ultimately. So, um, so, so, so in some ways it echoes what you've said already, really, um, because it's rather than from a necessary ramifications to a prudential regulator. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, speaking about a uh, prudential regulator, um, what do you think are the insure tax implications on the prudential regulation, or what is the Bank of England doing this aspect? Well, it's, um, I mean, again, the report highlighted some of the aspects, and I think um, it, it's always for us to see as a prudential regulator, are we getting the right reporting in to be able to track and monitor? So clearly, you know, when would we know when the risks are such that uh, there is a problem, and are we getting the right information at the moment. Um, so I guess one of the aspects could be that people are discussing is things like the cloud. So I understand there's one cloud provider that uh, most firms are using. So what happens when that one goes down? And uh, are we, as a matter of course, getting information to be able to track those? Um, the other one is, say, cyber insurance. So clearly that's a, a bigger growth area with, with, with all this. And again, if you look at Solvency 2 reporting, um, D should that keep pace with it? For the moment, there's no separate reporting on those on those lines of business or the exposures that firms are running. Um, and again, it's it's, it's clearly there's it, 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 it is still in its, in its infancy. But I kind of think when when would we know when it is a problem? And I think that's something um, as a uh, prudential regulator, you'd always have to challenge yourself on a regular basis to make sure that that is still appropriate. Yeah, that's very important for a prudential regulator. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, more than about 15 minutes to go, so um, I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Well, while folks are gathering their thoughts, um, I'm Bernie Birnbaum with the Center for Economic Justice. Um, so I was really moved by the idea of encouraging consumers to shop on things other than the basis of price. Um, in most other consumer product markets, there's lots of information about how the product performs and consumers can shop around on that basis. But when it comes to insurance, there's no 
information about how well the product performs. You can't go to a website and find out um, how different insurers settle claims, how quickly insurers settle claims, how frequently insurers challenge claims, how frequently people are forced into litigation. Um, similarly, there's no way to compare insurers about what types of data, personal data they collect and how successful they are at protecting it. Um, there's also no way to, for, insure, for consumers to compare the loss mitigation partnerships that different insurance companies offer. So um, in terms of moving away from consumers pricing um, or shopping simply on the basis of price, uh, I wanted to ask if um, the representative from the one insurance company, <laughs> if um, you would be willing and if you think your insurance colleagues would be willing to um, report these types of data to regulators so that they could publish it so that um, insure tech companies could generate the, the shopping tools to enable consumers to shop around for things other than on the basis of price. Thank you. Interesting question. I have to think a bit about that, but I can imagine. Yeah, most of these items are kind of covered with consumer organizations in kind of ratings or money few kind of uh, rating systems for products. Um, I think that might be an angle. And I can imagine that um, going forward on, uh, on working on our data, analytics, models, etc., that we have a dialogue with that, with our uh, supervisors. I can imagine that. Can or can not? Can. Yeah. This is a new era, huh? this is for us, for you, and we have to work our, our way through. Just one question on that, yeah. one of the challenges, and I, I doubt it's unique to the United States, but we hear is um, the reluctance of both insurance companies as well as third party vendors to really disclose their modeling to um, not to regulators, in part because of uh, trade, you know, propriety, confidential information concerns, even if it is a confidential basis. But that basis, but that makes it very difficult for the regulators to do their job. I don't know if that's a, you know, if you can't look at the model and understand why, it's hard to justify its use. Yeah. And why are we doing that now? Well, in the United States, is that, well, again, depending on the jurisdiction, right, you can always, um, the regulator has the right to review the risk classifications and the right rate filings. Yeah. And so in some jurisdictions, that goes on, has gone on for 100 years. Uh, but it becomes much more difficult now because I think the, 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 uh, the analytics or the information and in how it's used is far more sophisticated than it was 15 years ago. Yeah, but the responsibility in my company is staying still at the same place. No? Whether it's a linear model or a algorithm model, it's still the actuarial department that's mastering it and is responsible. I, I do know that feeling because we set up some new models in our Spark Lab. Spark Lab is a kind of um, um, breeding ground without the company on, a, on, a, on a, a distance to make sure that they have their full open mind for our new opportunities. And then uh, they, they came up with a new model and they said, okay, how to shift it? Now, of course, we have to shift it to our, uh, into our uh, regular world and, uh, and, and include it in our uh, uh, responsibilities, just like the linear models. So um, um, it's an extended version, but it's not, it's not something completely different. I, mean, I, I don't want to monopolize. I had a comment, but go. Well, so. It, it is, and it, it, so, right, I mean, it, you know, and sometimes you see, I sort of drives everyone crazy, insure tech, so some companies say, you know, we're going to teach insurance companies how to price risk. Well, that's what insurance companies have been doing for quite a long time. It's how they have been a profitable industry, enterprise. But, you know, the ability in the IIS report, you know, talks about this a couple times, although briefly, the ability to much more analyze risk at a granular level, almost a personal level, again, so that's a good thing in the sense that we can understand a risk profile, 
but it also has significant potential to make insurance not accessible perhaps to more some people, but inaccessible, unaffordable to others. And that decision isn't because the actuaries are wrong or the math is wrong, it's because the public policy is, is violated. And that is a decision that insurers should be the first line of defense on, but the regulators have to be there to in the legislation to make those decisions. Yeah. But, but you could also say that perhaps things become less binary. So in the past, you would say, well, this segment, well, I'll simply not underwrite anything here because your lack of understanding. And now, given big data, improved ability to actually understand uh, things through uh, advanced analytics, it might compel you to say, well, perhaps it's not binary. Perhaps it's more sort of a question of risk return. And then parts of that segment are actually profitable uh, for me as an insurer. So I, I think it can also go the other way. That by, by you becoming more clever, some of the things you thought in the past they were just not right. But if you look at more sort of micro segments of the customers and yeah. where they live. It, and it absolutely has the ability yeah. to expand insurance in area that's not written. Yeah. Uh, yes, certainly. Yeah. It has the pluses and the minus, no? It's, yep. uh, but, but let's bring it back a bit to history when the insurance started with farmers teaming up together, pooling their risk. Uh, because there's a lot uh, of relation or uh, a lot of relation between data, solidarity, etc. But in these earlier days of farmers pulling up risk, there was, these, were, these guys were close and there was social contact to, to, to know who's running his uh, company how and, and what kind of risk is being uh, taken or not. And these days, um, ooh, <laughs> in these days, um, uh, insurance is much more on a distance, more anonymous. And somehow th this data might bring in behavior or the, at least the, the awareness of behavior is having impact on the risk pool and the solidarity between that risk pool. Yeah. Well, I think at, at the same time, we're seeing some schemes doing peer-to-peer -peer insurance or trying to, or at least right. saying they're doing peer-to-peer -peer insurance. We have things that sort of come out of communities on Facebook. So, so somebody are trying to go back a little bit to the old yeah. community idea. But I agree, in general, it's perhaps become less sort of uh, solidary, right. Right. Uh, the thinking. The solidarity is hard to see coming back, but the understanding of risk, you know, and, and or the ability like telematics, in yeah. which my, you know, it's a win-win-win, right? If I, if I drive safely and I get the information from my insurance company as to how I'm braking and driving in a different route that would be safer, I'm gonna have less accidents, the insurance company will profit, and society as a whole is better. Uh, that's, that's the great example. That's um, the best value. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess the concern is as well, it's, it's reduced um, sharing of risk, and so that ultimately you could get that adverse impact that you'll just simply get uh, uninsured drivers, higher uninsured yep. drivers, and then ultimately society picks up the tab through uh, other means, through yeah. taxation. There are plenty of instances where society makes decisions. We're not going to have each person bear their own risk. Health insurance is uh, you know, maybe the best example. But there is a solution. Uh, in, at least in Holland, we in, in the 60s, uh, the insurance industry set up Rialto because we do imagine then when uh, liability uh, coverage is, uh, th is that what, what you need to drive on the street? Mm. You, d there should be someone that's willing mm. to take the risk, also on the high risk profiles. Uh, but it has a price and it's high profile, so it's a separate company, you pay the price, yep. but you get insured. Yes. That's the solution. Yes, residual markets or high risk markets, right? Yeah. So I wanted to jump in on this issue of sort of increasing granularity in terms of risk segmentation. And that has a great promise if there's transparency to the consumer and the opportunity to give feedback to the consumer in real time so that it empowers the consumer to lower their loss profile. On the other hand, it can also be used to simply create more of a black box scoring model that creates less transparency to the consumer. So. That's how I would sort of distinguish between a way to benefit the consumer using this increased analytic capability to empower a consumer for loss mitigation versus empowering the insurer vis-a-vis -vis the consumer so that they can segment the population more and more without greater transparency to the consumer. What would you think about that? It's a balancing act somehow, no? I mean, this is a new world with a lot of new opportunities. 
becoming uh, to us to more data and more technique. And somehow together we have to balance this. I, I, I can't say right or wrong or yes or no. We'll have to find a way. Okay, thank you, Brittany, for the questions. Um, do we have other questions from the audience? I doubt this will be answered here, but I think one of the things I've been mulling over is is, a, is kind of a formalization of consumer bills of, bill of rights. In other words, and it's broader than the insured tech, so that's why, but at the same time as we think about the issues of insurance and say, you know, do I have rights to my data? Do I have a right to be able to see it, access it? Uh, can I take my data with it? Do I need to create a blockchain technology that keeps it private so it's not stolen. I mean, these are all, she said, we're in a new world, but I think uh, part of where I've been going is how do you frame it so that both uh, people exposed to risk and firms that can take that risk have the ability to exchange information and make a productive uh, uh, use of that. And I think the, the implications are we either end up with a very risk segmented society where I'm basically paying for my own risk or I'm willing to join in a pool that says, I'll start the journey here, and I, I, I enter at some point, but certainly over a longer period of time, I will be able to benefit from risk sharing. But it's a different paradigm, because with the idea of a consumer saying, every day I can wake up and change to a new provider, which is kind of the investment paradigm, is not the paradigm for long-term risk. So being able to articulate that, I think, both within ourselves and the implications is, for me, the interesting question over the next few years. I'm curious if that's kind of how you may see it as well. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> so I guess you're right. It is an interesting yes. question. <laughs> it's a question. Well, it does get to the trust and of, of how that information is used. You know, to continue the, and it's not a, the worst thing in the world, but to continue the telematics example, one of the models that a vendor says, well, in addition to, you know, in order to, for us, the vendor, to be able to analyze your driving pattern, we know exactly where you drive. Well, that's a privacy issue, but you've by, you know, brought into that if you've agreed to, to do it. Uh, but we also can offer you extra value. We can offer you coupons for the coffee shop that you pass three times out of every five days. Or we can, you know, we can, uh, we can, uh, so, uh, in other words, we can, you know, by analyzing your data, we can sell it and market it to third-party vendors that can provide you, well, is it a benefit? Maybe. A lot of people think it's an annoyance. But at a more serious level, the sale of, of this information is, is again, uh, I have no idea, and perhaps it's because I haven't read my terms and conditions, where the various, you know, where my data is sold. But I do know, for example, that um, my shopping habits of what food and products I buy are accessible to third-party vendors who use it to price my auto insurance. Well, thank you, Peter, for rescuing the panel. <laughs> so are there any answers from the panelists? I think, as again, an interesting question, but I think one of the things that we also have to look at, I mean, all people working with, with insurance is at all of this, the data, our ability to understand it, and actually the use of IoT where different parts of what we actually insure can communicate, it will actually also at some stage actually limit risks. So it will be sort of a, a, a safer world in, in many ways. So, so this about somebody having an information advantage now and somebody sort of need to be careful about what data we give away, that is perhaps it's only shorter term and the longer term perspective is actually we will have less, less risks. And then I'm sure, I mean, clever people in the insurance industry will find other things to insure, but where exactly where the data advantage and that stuff, it doesn't, doesn't play out too well. So, so I think that's also an interesting thing to, to, to think about, that this is, yes, we use it as, as insurers, but actually a lot of this goes into prevention. A lot of the people that, I mean, so when we talk about sort of autonomous cars, so sort of the, the number of claims and the severity of the claims we see in the motor area once we get sort of self-driving cars that are much better at driving than we are, that is just going to have a, a, an immense impact as well. So I think that's, I mean, I know we shouldn't downplay some of these things, but I think sort of the end game with this is really that uh, sort of insurance will have to do something else potentially because uh, this will um, be a less risky world. 
Uh, and I think for the insurers, I think the, it's still good news. There are other things to insure. I'm sure there will be new, now we hear about cyber threats and, and all that. Uh, but, but um, and, and also services. So combining the insurance offering with something else. I think that's also an interesting on this about sort of the data uh, side of it. That's interesting, thank you. Um, well, if there, if there are no more questions from the audience, I would like to conclude this panel. Uh, well, thank you for my excellent panelists who make it really easy for me. You answer the questions automatically. <laughs> and also thank you for the audience uh, for the provoking questions. So thank you very much again, very excellent panel. Please big applause for But after this panel, we really think that this data issue is a profound issue to think about. So in the future, I assume that each individual ourselves price tag of insurance. So my health insurance, this amount, and yours is the amount. So it's a little bit different from pooling or issue, but more individual granular level of insurance premium and coverage. Is it a good thing or bad thing that we have debated? without no conclusion. But I think that is very important thing to think about in the future. So again, thank you very much. So we have a break. Oh, oh good, we have 30 minutes break, <laughs> lucky. So next panel will start uh, uh, 3.45 uh, here, so thank you.